hit it, Phil. Da, 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 da. Can it be the breeze that fills the trees with rare and magic perfume? Oh, no! <laughs> it isn't the breeze, it's Jackson time. La, da, da, da. Stay tuned. Right after this episode. For our discussion. From Television City in Hollywood, the Jack Benny Program, presented by Lucky Strike. Light up, a lucky, it's light up time. Be happy, go lucky, it's light up time. For the taste that you like, light up, a lucky strike. Relax, it's light up time. Our friend Happy Joe Lucky has the right idea. Relax and light up a better tasting Lucky Strike. You'll find that Luckies do taste better, and for good reasons. First, LSMFT. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. And then that fine, good tasting tobacco is toasted. It's toasted to taste even better, cleaner, fresher, smoother. So light up a Lucky. You'll say it's the best tasting cigarette you ever smoked. For the taste that you like, light up a Lucky Strike. Right now. Light up a lucky. It's light up time. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Lucky Strike program. You know, today I am very, very happy and very proud because uh, last night my 10-year-old son, Leonard, won $100,000 <laughs> by answering all the questions about the stock market, you see. Well, he isn't my son yet. <laughs> I filed the adoption papers this morning. <laughs> Oh, oh, I forgot before I go on, so I came out with these glasses. If there's a Mrs. Ann Clem of 237 South Crescent Drive in the audience, please go home immediately. You left the water running in the bathtub. <laughs> teach her not to take my parking space. <laughs> Did you notice, ladies and gentlemen, that every time I do a show, I always come out and I start out by saying, thank you very much and welcome to the Lucky Strike program. Now, I don't do what most of the other entertainers do. They always come out and they make a big thing about thanking you for allowing them into your living room. I don't do that. In the first place, I don't know where your television set is. <laughs> in the first place, it may not be in the living room. It might be in the, in the library or the den or the hawk shop. <laughs> oh, for the benefit of you folks who live in Beverly Hills, a hawk shop is a place where people go to pawn things <laughs> when they haven't got enough money. <laughs> they don't know about those things. <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, <laughs> I own one of those places myself. You know, I have a place on Main Street. It's, uh, in case any of you are short of money, I have a place on Main Street, it's called the Drive-In Pawn Shop. <laughs> you drive in and walk home. <laughs> well, anyway, you know, this, um, let's see, I have about five more shows, four or five more to do after this, after today, because I think up until about June 17th, and then, I'm taking a trip to Europe. I'm going over on a vacation, you see. And of course, there's so many people traveling this year that you've got to make your plans way in advance. 
And I also, I always, already have my reservation on the boat going to uh, London. I should arrive in England any time, I don't know, between the end of June and the first week of July. It all depends on how long it takes them to load the bananas in Brazil. <laughs> Always take that boat. I love it. <laughs> All I have to do is bring my own cornflakes. They have the rest. <laughs> they can't peel you. They give you a room. This is <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, I thought I'd try the last one. I didn't mean that. <laughs> Somebody told me to try it. Um, but anyway, I've got uh, everything all set now, the boat, my reservations in England, in London. Rochester, I I'm right in the middle of a show here. Yeah, I know, but this envelope came for you, special delivery, and I thought it was urgent. Urgent? Let me see it. Oh, this is my passport. I mean, what made you think it was urgent? Well, when I saw the United States government on the envelope, I knew you were drafted. <laughs> Me drafted? Well, I was so sure I brought your toothbrush, your old sailor suit, and a bottle of seasick pills. Seasick <laughs> pills? You thought of everything, didn't you? Well, I only thought of the toothbrush. The pills were in your sailor suit. <laughs> hey, Rochester, you want to do something? Take out the suit. I'd like to show you folks the sailor suit I wore when I was stationed at Great Lakes Naval Training Center at, during the First World War. Oh, my goodness. Look at these in the pants I wore then. The, I haven't worn these pants since that last day when the commanding officer said goodbye to me. I remember. <laughs> Have you got the blouse there, too? Let's see, let's see the blouse I used to wear. Oh. <laughs> Gosh, it's been so long, I don't remember those medals. You know? I know, I bought them on the way down here. <laughs> well, where'd you get them? Someplace on Main Street, I drove in and walked home. <laughs> well, good, good. Well, Roger, now look at, uh, I'm going to be kind of hungry after the show. In fact, I didn't even have lunch. So uh, prepare a nice dinner. What have we got to eat for tonight? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? What have we got in the ice box? One lamb chop, a half a potato, and a small dish of peas. See, that isn't very much, is it? Not when you consider I'll get home first. <laughs> <laughs> You'll wait in the dressing room for me, and we'll take an even start on this thing. Goodbye. Yes. So long. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm so glad that I finally got my passport. You know, for those of you who don't, don't, don't travel much, who have never been to England, you don't know what you go through to try to get a passport or anything. First, you have to go to the federal building. Then, well, anyway, let me show you what happened to me yesterday. Got my passport and what's more Gonna fly on Super Constellation Long to hear those motors roar Venice, moonlight on the water Naples, music, love and laughter Florence, how could I forget That holiday in old Marseille Never thought my heart could be so yearning Why did I delay so long? Gonna take this man a bit Paris in the spring, love is in the air. I miss my Swiss, my Swiss miss misses me. I miss the bliss that Swiss kiss gives to me. 
In a little Spanish town was on a night like this. Yes, yes, we can guess. Tell us more, please, senor. Stars were peekabooing down, was on a night like this. And then did you meet a senorita cute and sweet? Did she play her castanet while you smoked your cigarette? Cigarette! Lucky strike, take luckies on your journey, cause they're toasted, as you know. Clean or fresh or smooth or take a journey, fully packed and ready to glow. Lucky, then he said the Martin, lucky, I'll sell him by the carton, lucky, Alice M. P. A lucky strike, the smoke you like. Lucky strikes, preferred in Monte Carlo, in Paris, in Nice and Rome. Just be sure you take enough to last you till you make that journey back home. Till you make that journey back home. Love that LSMFT. Love that LSMFT. Thomas Wade. Your address? 5329 Cowingham. Oh, pardon me, is this where you uh, get your application for a passport? Yeah, it is. Thank you. I am going back to Sweden to marry Hilda, my childhood sweetheart. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that's why I'm so excited. You know, I'm going to leave as soon as I get my passport. You know, already my relatives have uh, come back to Sweden for the wedding. There's uh, Ole Olsen, Janne Jansson, uh, Sven Svensson, Pete Peterson, and Bridie Murphy. <laughs> Bridie Murphy? She came back without the passport. <laughs> oh, I sure will be happy to get on that boat. I imagine. Oh, yes. sailing, sailing over the bounding main. Many a storm events can blow before I come back again. <laughs> sailing, sailing. Are you next? Yeah, I have Olaf Jorgensen. Oh, Olaf Jorgensen. Yeah. Uh, you filled out a passport yesterday. Yeah. Oh, I have, I have it right here. So, here it is. You take that to window four and they'll take care of you. Yeah. Uh, do you wish to apply for a passport? Yeah. I mean, yes. <laughs> I'd like to get a passport. What do I have to do? Well, first you have to fill out this application. Oh. I'll help you with it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Your name? Jack Benny. Your address? 366 North Camden Drive. Place of birth? Waukegan, Illinois. Your age? 39. <laughs> 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 Uh, five feet ten. Your weight? One fifty-six. Your age? Thirty-nine. <laughs> <laughs> Your complexion? Fair. Birthmarks? None. Your age? 39. <laughs> Your occupation? Comedian. I thought so. <laughs> Color of hair? Brown. Color of eyes? My eyes? Oh, they're blue, aren't they? Bluer than the feet of a Sicilian wine crusher. <laughs> London, Rome, and Paris. London, Rome, and Paris. Yes. There you are. Thank you. And I hope you have a very nice vacation. 
Well, I intend to take a vacation, but I'm sure that as soon as they know that I'm in England, they'll probably want me to play a week at the Palladium Theater, play work there, you know? Work? Yes. Oh, you'll have to go to Window 4. Oh, wait a minute, man. <laughs> Look, Miss. Miss, Mary, work person. Miss, please. <laughs> May I help you? Yes. Is this where I get a temporary work permit? Yes. Your name? Jack Benny. <laughs> your address? 366 North Camden Drive. Height? Uh, five feet ten. Weight? 156. Color of hair? Brown. Color of eyes? My eyes? <laughs> They're blue, aren't they? Bluer than the stomach of a dachshund that was chased through a huckleberry patch. <laughs> That takes care of the personal question. Oh, wait a minute, you, you haven't asked me my age. Well, I didn't think it was necessary. I took one look at you and I figured you're the same age as I am. Oh, well, thank you very, very much. How old are you? 62. <laughs> that opened my big mouth. <laughs> I guess this application's in order. All you have to do now is tell me where you intend to spend your vacation, where you're going to work, and for how long. Well, I was only going to play a week, you know, work a week at the Palladium Theater London, but I'll probably be such a big hit that they'll want to hold me over for my entire stay. You may work your entire stay? Yes. Well, then this is the wrong application. No, wait! We know no, 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 Wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not going to work. I've changed my mind. I'm not going to work. I'm just going to take I, I'm not working at all. Just a vacation. I'm not going to work at all. <laughs> Just a vacation, that's all. Well, in that case, you'll have to go back to window one. I know, I know. <laughs> Gee, I'm thirsty. I wonder where the water cooler is. Pardon me, uh, I'd like to get a drink. Okay. Your name? Jack <laughs> <laughs> Address? Three th oh, never mind. <laughs> Oh, miss. Oh, hello. How'd you enjoy your trip? <laughs> I didn't go anyplace yet. Look, miss, I decided uh, that I'm not going to work at all. I'm just oh. going to take a vacation the entire time. <laughs> well, I imagine I'll have to go through all of that again, huh? The question? Oh, well, I think I remember everything. Oh, well, good. Yeah. Your name is Jack Benny. That's right. You live at 366 North Camden That's Drive. That's my home, yes. Born in Waukegan. Waukegan, Illinois. Right. Five feet, ten inches tall. Right. Your hair is brown. Your eyes are... They're blue, aren't they? <laughs> Ask me that again, will you? <laughs> Your eyes are blue, aren't they? Bluer than the thumb of a cross-eyed carpenter. <laughs> now, if you'll just give me your passport photos, I'll attach them to the application. Photos? Well, yes, you can't get a passport without pictures. Oh. oh, you can have them taken right across the hall in room six. But after all I went through to get the passport, now pictures. I never thought that would develop. Picture develop? <laughs> oh, that's very funny. <laughs> Picture develop. <laughs> was alive. <laughs> Where do I go to get these, these uh, pictures? Right across the hall in room six, and then go to window three. After I get the picture yes. there? Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. <laughs> oh, pardon me. 
Are, are you the photographer? Uh, yeah, I'm the photographer. Well, look, uh, would you like to take a photo picture, a uh, photo passport picture of me? Oh, I'd love to. Oh, fine. Where do you want me to stand? Outside. I don't work during my lunch hour. <laughs> Make an exception in my case. I've been through so much. I want to get home. You know? Everybody's in a hurry. All right, sit down here. Now smile. That's it. Now hold that smile. <laughs> You don't want, if you're not going to take my picture, why do you want me to smile? I don't like grouchy people around me. <laughs> Look, I don't care about this. I want my picture taken. I want to get out of right, here. All right, don't get excited. Just sit up straight in your chair. Now, hold your chin up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, now, put your nose on this uh, string. <laughs> never done this before. Why are you lining me up this way? I used to take photo finishes at Santa Anita. <laughs> Santa Anita? <laughs> I, don't, I want the pictures taken in a regular way. That's all, all right, I want. All right, all right. <laughs> all right, now. Watch the birdie. The birdie? There's a chicken sandwich. <laughs> Uh, Joe? Joe? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Who of you in there? I don't like to be alone in a dark. <laughs> there we are. Uh, this will just take a second. It develops automatically. <laughs> there we are. Gee, that's an excellent picture. Oh, my goodness. I mean, it, it, it doesn't flatter me, but it, it's just wonderful. I really look good there. Oh, I'm glad you like it. Yeah, how, how much? Wait, wait. Uh, that'll be 75 cents. Oh, here's a dollar. Keep the change. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Gee, a quarter tip. Hey, Joe, you was right. Those photos of Rock Hudson are working like magic. Good. <laughs> Well, mister... Mister. Yeah. <laughs> what can I do for you? Well, my name is Jack Benny. And Jack I... Benny? Yeah. <laughs> they uh, told me that I could get my passport picture here and that if I could get it, that you'd help me. Help? Yeah. Well, I'm going to leave town. I thought maybe you'd help me. Uh... Oh, I'll even carry your bags. <laughs> now, don't be funny, will you? Now, just give me my pass. I've had enough to do. Now, just give me my pa passport. Oh, please. all right. Now, uh, tell me, uh, do you intend to return to the United States within one year? Yes. Mm hmm Have you ever sworn allegiance to a foreign country? What? Well, don't worry. We don't count anything before the Boston Tea Party. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm an American citizen. I was born here. Oh, good. Then you won't have any trouble answering these questions for me. Now tell me, in what city is the Liberty Bell located? Philadelphia. Uh, huh? And uh, what was the name of the all-metal battleship used by the North during the Civil War? The Monitor. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what is the middle name of President Rutherford B. Hayes? Gee, that's tough. Yeah, I don't know that one. Oh, I wish you did. It's lousing up my crossword puzzle. <laughs> what? You know, what's a five-letter word? I don't care about it. <laughs> now, look, I want to get my passport. If you don't want to give it to me, tell me where, tell me where I should go. Oh, I'd love to. <laughs> but I'm with the State Department, and I have to be diplomatic. <laughs> I've had just about enough of this. I've stood all that I can. You come out here, and I'll... Punch you right in the nose. You? Yes. I, want, I know my rights, and I'm no coward. Oh, you are. If you scrubbed your back with Pepsi Dent, you'd wonder where the yellow went. <laughs> oh, yeah? Well, come on out here. I'll show you. Oh, all right. Very well. I'm out of here. What happened to you? Oh, well, I, I 
went to that big wedding in Monaco and they were stealing everything. Jack will be back in a minute, but first a word to cigarette smokers. It's light up time. It's light up time. Be happy, go lucky. It's light up time. For the teeth that you like, light up a lucky strike. Relax. It's light up time. How good that smoke is after a swim. And it's got to be a lucky, cause only luckies give you that famous better taste. Here's why. L-S-M-F-T. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Naturally good tasting tobacco that's toasted. It's toasted to taste even better. Cleaner, fresher, smoother. Next time you buy cigarettes, get in the swim. Be happy. Go lucky. For the taste that you like, light up a Lucky Strike. Right now. Light up a Lucky. It's light up time. You'll say it's the best tasting cigarette you ever smoked. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed the show. You know, I have to leave for the East now. I have a few things that I'm going to do. And then as I announce on my last show, next Saturday, which is the 28th, I believe, uh, I'm giving a concert at Oklahoma City, the municipal, the municipal stadium. This is a charity affair. It's for the National Association for Retarded Children and also for their symphony orchestra there. And the uh, governor, Raymond Gary, is proclaiming that Jack Benny Day in Oklahoma. Of course, as a rule on legal holidays, they close all places of business. But on my day, the banks are staying open two hours longer. <laughs> That's so I can browse around. You know? <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, be sure and watch Ann Southern next Sunday, and I'll be back in two weeks. Thank you very, very much. Well, hello again. This is Buck Benny speaking. I am joined by our full cast of inmates here as we present uh jack uh his this episode we're going to launch into him going on his trips around the world and of course the first thing we need to do is get our passport so jack gets his passport oh and speaking of passports uh i have my passport i'm ready for the trip uh, does anyone else have it have their passport with them I, i've got my it's got my passport photo it's a lovely <laughs> lovely picture of me that's one of my best um, oh, it's okay on, that you guys don't have them. I have, so I, can... I have extra passports, so so I, I I have all my various identities I use. I probably shouldn't be saying this on YouTube, but anyway, it's funny. One of my identities is my wife, and one of them is my daughter. But that's okay. And my son's is missing, but I think he's got his back where he lives. So, anyway, yeah. but uh, the whole story of getting those passports was crazy, and trying to get them in time to before our trip and it was like all the timing was kind of it was, it was a little scary but we got them in plenty of time before we went on our big trip um to europe and uh jack is going to do the same thing he goes on a trip to europe and goes all around and we get a chance to spend some time with him doing that and i love that he in preparation he mentions that they're going to do that in this episode um and so that's that's a cool thing. Anyway, uh, we'll just go around and chat about the episode a little bit. And I uh, hope you guys are all going to enjoy this episode. So we have Terry back with us. Uh, Terry, what um, what are your thoughts on the episode? What did you, what stood out to you? Well, I guess I'm going to begin with Leonard Ross. Yeah, Leonard, also known in by his friends as Lenny. <laughs> I had never heard of Leonard Ross before. Oh, yes. So I did a little reading. And on the day before this episode was broadcast, on April the 21st, 1956, mm -hmm. which is my sister's birthday. She was born on that date, on April 21, 1956. Um, wow. And her first birthday, I think, was Easter, by the way. Anyway, <laughs> um, he won $100,000 on a TV game show called The Big Surprise, which was on NBC. Uh, the, uh, the host was Mike Wallace. This is before his, his uh, CBS uh, 60 Minutes days. 
Um, and he was a child prodigy, knew apparently everything there was to know about the stock market. He uh, was, was really quite a genius, but he had a very tragic uh, life because he was so uh, smart and so out of place in, in among his peers. He, uh, he developed uh, some, some psychological problems and ended up uh, taking his own life uh, at a very early age. But when, when Jack Benny refers to uh, adopting Leonard, everybody knew who he was talking about. It was, right. it was you know, like talking about, what was the guy on uh, uh, Ken uh, on, on Jeopardy? Yeah. Ken yeah. Jennings. Yeah. Jennings. You know, yeah. It would have been the same, same kind of joke. Everybody in America knew who he was talking about. I didn't know. Um, but then I again, I was either. only, so you know, I, I was only, I was only three years old at the time. So, yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things that I noticed in this episode throughout this episode, and we've talked about it, uh, in, at other times is, is the timing. Uh, Jack Benny, of course, famous as being the master of comic timing, uh, propagated that throughout his cast. The long takes that had me on the floor laughing as people were just standing there looking at each other and waiting as the audience laughed harder and harder and harder. Genius. Um, I don't know how you do, as, a, as one who has written and, and performed a bit uh, of comedy, I don't know how you do that that well without, obviously, the years of experience that Jack had in vaudeville and radio, but, but also without the audience feedback. You have to have that, I think in order to pull off the timing, but Jack just knew it was in his bones. And, and so I, I was most amazed by that. I thought it was interesting that Jack Benny in the opening of this episode talks to the live studio audience, not to the camera. And it's it, obviously early in television, this is 1956, but he had not yet developed and you know maybe it just wasn't done yet talking to the camera the the bigger audience the, right. the national audience rather than the studio audience and that maybe is his connection to his vaudeville days the his audience even though he knew he was on tv right mm -hmm. his audience was the actual audience it worked i didn't feel left out as a right. viewer but it was a departure from what was to become the more normal thing which uh, you know, obviously guys like Johnny Carson and others did, which was to talk to the bigger audience the, right. through the camera. I, um, I always feel like it's a situation where you have, you, you almost find yourself magically involved in the studio audience yourself. I love that he does yeah. that because it makes me feel like I'm a part of that live audience. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's different to a certain respect if somebody talks directly to me from the camera like if mel brooks pulled the gag like that or like like anything like that i i feel more involved if he's addressing it like that and in a sense like it puts me in the seats back at the cbs studios as opposed to uh reinforcing the the layer that is my television you know right. it's, it's it's one more way to step into there at least for me and i would agree with that in this episode more than most of the lives somehow it made me feel more like I was there and more like, okay, this is live. And, and, uh, uh, mm. and one thing I was going to see if someone else mentioned, but I'm going to go ahead and mention it. Uh, when the, when the curtain goes up and you can see the curtain go up and this whole scene that we're going to spend the rest of the episode in is there all laid out for us. It really makes you go, Oh, this is like a play. And, and this is there, mm. you know, and this is what we're going to see. And, and, it's charming, and I just, I just love it. And and you know who else does that? How today? well they use that stage is wonderful too. You know who else does that today? Uh, Saturday Night Live. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. they, they will in after every almost every sketch, they'll pull back the curtain, or sometimes before the sketch, and you'll see that it's actually a set. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. and it is. I agree with you. It's charming. It's just it was not. It was not conventional in 1956 to talk to the audience through the camera. There are mm -hmm. a couple of other references that I'm not sure our modern audience will get. Yeah. One is to the aircraft that they were going to be on. Uh, and it was in the, uh, the Sportsman Quartet song. And they referred to the Super Constellation aircraft, which was um, Lockheed's uh, response to the, the DC-6 aircraft. But it was a very popular um, four engine propeller driven 
uh, aircraft for, for early commercial flight yeah. in America. He also refers to, who was it? Oh, it was uh, Virginia Ty. I'm sorry, it was, um, well, I've said it now. It was someone who refers to Bridie Murphy. Bridie Murphy, yes. And Bridie Murphy, who was one of the personalities remembered by Virginia Ty, one of her past lives. Um, the reason, the, the context of that reference is that um, someone is making, uh, who was it who was making the, uh, the comebacks? Uh, several people were coming back and, oh, it was, I think it was Dennis Day. And he says, um, he, he uh, came back. I'm sorry, I've forgotten this. It's been too long since I saw the episode. But then he said, uh, and, and Bridie Murphy. Uh, oh, oh, it was, it was, uh, it was Yorgi Jorgensen, Yogi Jorgensen. Okay. And he talks about the different people who are coming yeah, to the event, the, the, the family right. gathering, the reunion. Yeah. And yeah. it's Pete Peterson and, and John and Bridie Murphy. And it yeah. was Bridie Murphy. Well, Bridie Murphy uh, came back without a passport. And that's why it was the, the ah. reference to her return from a past life. What's funny, ah. Terry, is I wasn't sure whether you were going to be here. So I actually looked that one up to to play Terry, and I don't need to play Terry because we actually have Terry here to be Terry. So that's all good. <laughs> the 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 last thing I want to say is that in in keeping with the timing um, matter, um, they did the age joke. I think it was three times reference to Jack Benny's age. Yeah, and the blue eyed joke. Yeah, three or four times. Yeah. And again, this is. Jack Benny's genius at work in front of us, that he can do this over and over and over and over, and we will still laugh at it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's to me, to, to this day, it remains amazing that he was able to pull that off. Yeah. Well, he was well, smart only that. when he was hammering that in to have Richard Deacon behind him and he can play off of Richard Deacon each time, which which took the joke even further. And so yeah, that that worked. It, that 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 lesson that Jack taught years ago finds itself stuck in some of the best works we see today. Um, I refer back to the Coen brothers for this. They, they must have seen some, either some Jack program or some other program that instilled this rule of three, because I'll, I'll always refer back to the care for some gopher bit in Oh Brother, Where Art Thou as an example of if you repeat the joke three times, the third time it is the most hilarious thing you've ever heard because they just keep saying it. Uh, like, And uh, there's a line that I won't quote on here because we're a family-friendly show, but it's in The Lady Killers and it involves a waffle hut. And so like that that rep repetitive nature. But I, I have a question for you, Terry, on that blue-eyed joke. And um, it's... I don't know if anybody else got this sense. It seemed like the people who were asking the question, oh, are they, oh they're blue, aren't they? Felt more disinterested than I have ever seen in my life compared to the radio versions of that gag. It almost feels like they were trying to be too officious in the travel agency job that they forgot that they're a comedy performer as well Back, i think i think we have two dynamics at work here not to mm -hmm. overanalyze comedy because as you know that's a good way to oh yeah no it makes it not it makes it not funny at all <laughs> but, <laughs> so funny. but jack benny did two things at the same time which again underlines his genius and one was the timing mm -hmm. the other was as i referred to a moment ago and and rochester does it at the beginning of this episode the deadpan humor and that's what they were drawing on here. They weren't being disinterested. They were doing what Richard Deacon did. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the woman whose name I've forgotten now, who was the, uh, the passport officer, uh, oh, they're blue, aren't they? Yes, yeah. you're right. It sounds like she doesn't really care. It's, it's the world around Jack Benny, and it, it heightens his overreaction to his own joke. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. the, you know, the over the top laugh it's the pounding on the table that, that he does that's right yes, that's yes. right and knocking stuff down which i think was a mistake yeah, yeah. it was a mistake yeah he, he knocks things over and just just moves on it's like oh this thing's and, lying and on the ground times, and you're times, wondering what is that he knocked over i think it was a stamp <laughs> and other times or it'll be a throwaway line like the, the wedding in monaco well again at the time everybody knew about the prince rainier and grace yeah. kelly wedding but he just tossed it away 
because yeah. he knew that everybody would get the joke. I was actually going to ask you about that because I, I, I've heard about the wedding in Monaco, mm -hmm. but I didn't know they were stealing everything, what that means. Oh, it's, it's, beca it's because uh, everybody got to go to the wedding and there was all this, I mean, it was elaborate and there was all this stuff. I and see. People were it, it, it was like, it was like among the, the, it's, it's the equivalent of whenever somebody from the UK royalty gets married, like the, the set, the pomp and ceremony on that and combined the fact that it was Grace Kelly, like that, that, you know, like within the realm of Hitchcock, that was a huge deal and also a big blow to him. And so like, it wouldn't surprise me that they were like literally talking about like literally getting away with theft with all the stuff that was just lavished upon that wedding. Mm -hmm. um, ter Terry, I, I, I love that you brought up the point about that deadpan because it does, it, it seems to help me understand further too how in the radio shows, they're a little bit more exaggerated with that delivery because it is an audible only format. So on television, they are able to get away with a little bit more of a flat but perfect delivery and like the one time i i saw it go into radio territory was when <clears throat> she uh asked his occupation he said comedian and it was after the 39 gag and she goes i thought so like that like that's that's it's i thought that worked really really well that that it, line uh, yeah it really paid off the previous line of him saying his age and her just not responding to that it was like oh shouldn't she respond to that and then and jack did that slow burn take yeah, which yeah. Yeah. Again, genius Jack Manny to know to do it and to know how long to do it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to put in a quick plug for the sportsman, and and to think because uh, they make the commercial message so enjoyable, and the fact that um, the writers had found a way to keep that fresh. You know, that's uh, the the sportsman had been on Jack's radio show for ten years since 1946 and that they were able in television to move and dance i knew they had i know they had a nightclub routine the uh, group members uh, uh, when they weren't doing jack's show but um uh, making that extra effort to make the uh, the commercials hilarious and that they could still uh, uh seeming to me to be fresh and new they were like a Motown act. I was amazed by their move. <laughs> I, I always well, think Kathy, sportsmen... thanks for, for mentioning that. That was that was great because uh, we've had them in a couple episodes, and the episode's been so packed with things we're talking about, we haven't mentioned them. And I and I felt guilty every time because they do such a good job every time we see them. And I wish we had more of these, but these live shows so often have the commercials intact it's, it's, and yeah. have the whole thing they're not cut so I, it made me wonder did did eddie anderson choreograph that i mean it was really a, an amazing dance yeah. number well i want to believe that he did suitcases behind the them and i was like are they i'm sure they're going to use those there's four suitcases for them and they did they they had them as part of the 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 piece uh just a, a wonderful piece yeah mm -hmm. i i always find the sportsman so entertaining even apart from the cigarette ads mm -hmm. and actually the opening, I always, I think the style of the 50s animation is also very, you know, endearing and like the opening oh, commercial as well. Joe Lucky, yeah. yeah. But I got to say, that swimming commercial <laughs> actually made me want to, you know, take up smoking. <laughs> join, join the club, Henderson. It's smooth. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, the other thing I wanted to point out with this episode <clears throat> is at the end of it, we were talking before we came on, uh, Terry was saying it was, uh, was an episode that was running a little short. And so they put a public service announcement at the end about forest fires that, that Don narrates. And for folks that have listened to the radio show, we're used to hearing that a lot with a lot of different uh, public announcements like that. And yeah. to get it in television is kind of neat. Uh, plus the fact that it kind of triggered with me. Oh yeah, this is very soon after the radio show went away. This is either the season after or the season after that. It's within two seasons of the radio show being gone. And so it again is another way that it makes you feel like, okay, yeah, this is kind of an extension of the radio show. And and uh, even and Daryl, isn't it interesting it? that they had a cigarette company as their sponsor? And with all the with all that entailed and with all the power that they had, <laughs> yeah. and yet in their public service announcement, they're able to say, be careful with your cigarettes. Don't don't yeah. cause a fire. Yeah. 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 
Well, it's it's uh, it's the equivalent of the camel doctor. Doctors prefer camels. Like it, it's it, well, it blows my mind. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, but it's it's uh, also being very aware to try and keep on the good side of the uh, FCC. You know, try, right. look we're responsible. You know, kids it, it, under eighteen, please don't smoke this. Right. So, there's a lot of those in the back half of the radio years of Benny, and a lot of them in RMS Brooks. Those those past recordings, you'll hear PSAs for good citizenship about the one that always sticks out to me is what people think of our country depends on you. And I think it was mainly directed towards armed forces radio service recordings. And you had soldiers being like, now, don't don't mess around while you're in another country, please, you know, behave if yeah. you don't mind. Uh, but it, the, the whole idea of the forest fires, I actually don't know. And I'd love to know if anybody else knew. How big were the concerns of forest fires and natural parks at this time? Huge. Yeah. This at Huge. this particular moment? Wow. Yeah. Huge. Well, with all the people smoking, I think you had <laughs> more. I mean, really, you would have more opportunities for forest fires to start. I mean, people are throwing their cigarettes every which way. And yeah. especially those clumsy 10-year-olds and their cigarettes <laughs> habit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I wonder if Lenny Ross smoked. <laughs> Well, and then later on, we get the whole joke uh, on on the Carson. They do a huge bit, which is mm. supposed to be true, of, of when Jack threw a cigar out his window and got stopped by a police officer and, and his whole uh, chat with the police officer about, you know, how stingy I am. I would not have thrown away a cigar that had this much left of it that was barely lit, you know, sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, and he got away with it. The, the officer said, okay, you're very funny and we'll just give you a warning and but don't throw that out anymore. That's, that's I don't want to be a cheapskate, but if it'll get me out of a traffic ticket. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> well, John, did you have anything else you wanted to cover in this one? Well, I, I would just say, because my kids are always very reluctant to watch old television, black and white and all that. I would say this is the kind of episode that that they they if you watch it halfway you're not going to get it right. this is one you have to pay close attention to and if mm. you do it pays off it's really funny all the richard deacon stuff and even like the you know sort of the way that they pull it off where like this woman comes up to him and and bring, pulls him aside in the background and you don't even notice it so if you're not paying attention you're not going to get all these little things right. i love all the the question and answer stuff, uh, the Frank Nelson payoff to that is hilarious. The Mel Blank stuff is like him at the top of his game. The smile gag is hilarious. And the opening, I thought, was such a strong opening with the lady in the audience. And she steals the show just by her performance of walking out. I thought it was so hilarious. John, I'm glad you mentioned that. Wasn't, wasn't, that, a, uh, wasn't that reminiscent of uh, To Be or Not To Be? The, his movie? Oh, yeah. 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 There you go. There you yeah. go. That's great. Uh, I don't, I don't, I guess I haven't seen to be or not to be uh, oh, closely enough. Stop what you're doing. Okay. Oh. Leave the podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for, 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 well, that's a, that's, a, that's a good point. For anybody who out there who hasn't seen to be or not to be, which first of all, I'm not going to shame you, but Terry might. And then um, there's a scene where Joseph Tura, his character is delivering Hamlet's soliloquy and, uh, a young aviator played by Robert Stack is in the audience and he's given a cue by uh, Tura's wife that if she want, if he wants to meet her backstage to get up during Hamlet's soliloquy. And so when he goes to be or not to be, you see Robert Stack getting up and exiting, I think, like, yeah, like uh, stage right and uh, or stage left and it throws Tura off and it leads to this crisis of faith with Tura where he can't believe somebody walked out on him um I, I was in, I that's a great point Terry I didn't think about that but like the idea of like somebody just walking out on his performance the he capitalizes on that in his specials years later with the violin one where the end credits are people literally leaving him in the dirt yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. and also that. Rochester we haven't really like doubled into Rochester's performance on here but I love the gag about like well as soon as I saw this letter from the government I knew you've been drafted <laughs> <laughs> I, I love thinking about the different things that go on in Rochester's head in terms of what his boss receives in terms of mail or anything that just like where, where his mind will go. Like it's such a neat invention of the writer that they've given him such agency that he just makes these active decisions, albeit 
uh, albeit on very ridiculous grounds, but like they don't, they never feel denigrated. They always feel like he's just like, no, no, I, I care about this man. I have to protect him because he's, <laughs> he's, he's going to go off into the, into the yonder of war. So I'm not going to like leave him stuck behind. Um, you definitely feel like example. we wouldn't have Jack as long as we did if it wasn't for Rochester watching out for him all the time. <laughs> so. I, I more, agree. I, more than yeah. that, wasn't wasn't Rochester in many ways the puppet master? He was kind of controlling all yeah. of Jack's life. Yeah. 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 Although although anytime he would brag about that, Jack would immediately call him to the carpet on that in, yeah, the, in yeah. the terms of the show. Yeah. And like you know, it, it can't be said enough. You know, this is near. A, t- a point in Anderson's life where he's like, he, he's like not too far away from having a, uh, a major heart attack. Yeah. And the idea of him still like going this strong is always amazing to watch. And his timing, his timing and his delivery on television get better with each episode. I feel like anytime, like I watch a succession of it, like he, he starts to learn and understand where, the, where the camera is going to be his best friend. Mm-hmm. And it's incredible to watch him evolve as a performer. Whereas Jack already kind of had stage experience in the respect of how it pertained to his character. It's almost like Eddie had to kind of learn how he was going to really pull it off. Cause the only he really had, the experience he would have had prior for a filmed version of his character would have been Buck Benny rides again, man about town and um, love thy neighbor. So you only have like a few, a few ways for him to fully audition that idea. Well, well and in fairness, he was kind of limited in what he, I mean, his, the character, his uh, role was, was put in limited situations. It, it took uh, the, the writers uh, some time to find other things for Rochester to do, but right. you're right, Zach. I mean, he really flourished over time yep. in within the, the role he was given. I, I always, feel, I always feel like, the, I feel like the perfection of that honestly comes from, and I can't remember if it's before or after, but what we're talking about, but when, uh, on, uh, this is my day off, like when he's sitting in the chair, comfy and cozy, like it feel th- that to me feels like the perfection of, he knew, how to milk that image and that and and what's amazing is how inactive it is from a physical standpoint by comparison to what we'd think might happen and yet he's given this perfect like stoic like staging in the way jack would where he would respond to an action but he's ignoring the action instead and 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 in this one in particular he actually i feel like i see eddie giving looks to the camera or just you know really deadpanning it like if we're going to talk about deadpanning, I feel like anytime he delivers something, Anderson just stays firm. And yeah. I've never seen Eddie break. Right. I've seen other people break. I see Jack break up all the, we, we see him break up all the time. Eddie never breaks. He right. never breaks his character. That's astounding. For yeah, live and, and speaking, speaking of that, I want to go back one more time to Richard Deacon. Mm. I, I don't know what those rehearsals were like, but by the time they shot this episode, he was rock. <laughs> yes. I don't know how he did it. I don't think I could have done it, uh, no matter how much I, I re- would rehearse that scene. But he was solid. He did not flinch. It was brilliant. I'm glad you well, went back to Richard Deacon, because I was just going to mention that that we'd looked up before we came on, because I don't think that was when we came on, is, is that he was on the Jack show six times. And uh, uh, very memorable whenever he's on. He does a, just a wonderful job here, as you're saying, and, and a tricky job because he, he's got to be this stern guy when Jack's being really funny, and that's got to be tough. Yeah. Um, we know him most, of course, for, for being on uh, the Dick Van Dyke show uh, as the fictional producer of the he's, show. I, I've been watching more Dick Van Dyke show recently, and yeah. he's so funny, especially yeah. with Maury Amsterdam. Yes. I mean, yuck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and me and my wife just crack up whenever they go at each other it's so funny and yep. and this is sort of an extension of what he's doing on the jack benny show where he's sort of like the the serious you mm-hmm. know deadpan guy uh but of course he plays it differently there but yeah i yeah go ahead he's i was gonna say he's also rutty lumperford's dad on uh on uh leave it to beaver and does a fun job he's he's excellent I, I don't know. I don't know if I've ever seen him give a poor performance. He just does a great job. And as you're saying, and Dick Van Dyke, if you want to see a tour de force for him, you got to watch Dick Van Dyke because he has a certain way of 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 working with Dick, 
and he has a certain way of working with Maury Amsterdam, and he has another way of working with Carl Reiner, because they're all in different, they all treat him completely differently, and he treats each of them completely differently from each other one, and because some of them are his boss, some of them are like a, somebody he sees as a lesser person, somebody he sees as a, as on the same level, and so it, it's just to see him navigate all that is wonderful. So it, it, um, that's that. Yeah. Anytime you see him chastising Amsterdam, that's him chastising Mel Brooks. That's that's how that worked because that's yeah. the connection tissue. But you're right, and I, it's actually interesting to see Deacon in that in in the world of Jack because it's mm -hmm. almost like in, in a lot of ways I wish I had seen more of him and Jack. Mm -hmm. um and even like it just it's almost i don't want to say it's a lost opportunity because we have like so such a perfect assemblage i wish i had a little more of him in the jack world yeah so right uh, just a, just a, just a tiny bit it's it's yeah. not it's not the end of the world but he gives like he, he his stoniness mm -hmm. like really works like, well against jack's reactivity to a lot of extent yes. like it's it's just if you're talking about deadpan i think that deacon had that that down pat so i know i'm reiterating but it's just like yeah it is astounding well, how he works it and it's a funny payoff where then jack tells the groaner about like develop i'm not sure if it's supposed to be just a really bad joke or if it's supposed to be he just said that and it wasn't even supposed to be a joke but then of course uh you know the richard deacon character cracks up at that when he was just given nothing to his uh, all his other stuff. It was pretty funny. Sim it's similar to um, uh, Percy Kilbride and the way he would crack Jack up with just saying a line. It wasn't a funny line, but Jack would just lose it. Right. And similarly, if you listen to Kilbride, it's similar to Deacon, not in delivery and not in character, but in terms of intent. Their intent is to deliver the line the response is completely spontaneous by, by depending on who is watching the material and responding to it. And more often than not, Jack is very astute at finding a talent that he knows will get a laugh on a line that shouldn't get a laugh. And he puts it in front of there and he keeps proving that experiment works constantly over and over again. on his show. Yeah. yeah. Kathy, did you have anything else you want to throw in on this episode? Um, no, I just, I really appreciate it. And it goes along with some others that he was making and about the same time when he did a Christmas episode in one on the stage when he play, does the airport instead of at the train station, you know, those kind of things. So uh, I, I appreciate these episodes. It was a little like the uh, uh, Easter parade we were talking about when it's about Jack interacting with many other people. Um, right. And yeah. it's it's a good a framework for him so right and and again it's one of these episodes and i mentioned it on one of the other ones we had where i i think this is the first time i watched this episode because jack gets a passport i'm like okay i'll watch something else that's uh, there's so much jack to choose from it's like the the title doesn't really make you go oh i'll soon as but some of these ones that sound mundane when you watch them are some of his best stuff um Carol, I, I, I would was, go further than that and say this is one of the funniest jack many television episodes of all yeah I, I laughed more and harder on this episode at, at jokes i'd heard before by the way yeah. moving that point that we were discussing I, I i rate this at or near the top of his uh, tv episodes yeah i i would i would 100 percent agree with that and and it'll be one of my favorites now that I revisit all the time. And I find that it's the episodes that don't have a guest star that I enjoy the most usually because it really, they have to bring out the comedy in the cast and you get to see more of the cast. And that's what I love. I love Mel Blanc. I love, uh, well, and, and uh, that's a whole piece we didn't even talk about yet. I don't think it was Mel Blanc. And I don't want to leave that uh, on the floor because it, that was to me probably one of the funniest scenes in the whole episode is just mel so often gets a little piece of a character and he does a wonderful job with it in this case he gets a, a large piece and an interesting character and a guy who he just chews it up i mean he really takes this guy to a whole nother level of of i don't even want to do this and you're making me do this this is my lunchtime and the whole thing and holding his 
his, uh, you know, watch the birdie or whatever because he's eating a chicken sandwich, and so he's watching. The you took sandwich. if you took Benny if you took Benny Rubin's character, yeah. and amplified him with so much begrudgment. That's what you get from here. Yeah, that, that yeah. it's like genuinely the like leave me alone character, and he. I love how he just like I, I love how he slips in a little horse whinny. Like it, it's yes. it's a good tour de force for him. Absolutely, it really is. I, I, yeah, if you're a big Mel Blanc fan, you'll love this episode. It, mm-hmm. His bit in here is just fantastic. Doesn't um, quite hit the Christmas episode, but it comes pretty close. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I, I, I will uh, point out one last thing that I noticed from watching all these episodes and we're popping around from 1960 to 1956 and all these things. Uh, a Rochester thing that's a very light Rochester thing, but I always think it's funny with Rochester, you never know what his hair is going to look like. He changes his toupee like every season to be something completely different. Sometimes it's like curly and sometimes it's just straight. You just never know. And it always looks just, good. You, he you, always looks good. He just looks completely different sometimes. And you're like, okay. And then sometimes it's a light my toupee mind, where he's yeah. almost bald. And then other times it's a full t- full on toupee. I don't know if who was in charge of figuring out what they were going to do with him. But yeah. Now that's a, I've, Dang it, Daryl, you blew my mind. I'm going to be going back now and trying to d- identify the different hairstyles for Rochester because that's yeah. I've never thought of that before. <laughs> yeah, you, you yeah. definitely notice it if you pop to the different seasons as, as the different ways that he, that he looks completely different. So. It's easy to notice when Basil Rathbone changes his hairstyle midway through the Sherlock Holmes series. It's another thing to be <laughs> like, wow, that. Yeah. Thank you. You blew my mind. Because Jack, you see it sometimes, you know, certain seasons, it'll be bushier than other seasons, his, mm-hmm. his toupee or whatever, but... But with Rochester, it just completely changes how it looks. Uh, but any that cover it pretty well. Anybody else got anything? The only reference we missed was Rock Hudson. They make a reference to Rock Hudson. Oh, that's right. Who, of course, is like a, a handsome co-star with uh, Doris Day or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and and they'll play up that. And it's, it's a funny little bit. I mean, there's so many little throwaway things. And I guarantee you, John, it wasn't the only thing we missed. There's We could do this like five times and mention different things every time. Uh, Like, like Terry's saying, such a good episode. So anyway, folks, real treat for you. Enjoy this and uh, we'll see you next time. Well, now uh, for something very special. Uh, Kathy, what do we have now? We've got a trailer for our upcoming episode. Wow. John. Uh, do you like trailers? Ooh, do I? All right, let's see it. I'm not the guy. Please tell us, if you let me go, I'll give you each a hundred gillion. What's a gillion? That was money before our time. <laughs> Scratch it.
I've been captain of King Henry VIII's cricket team for five years, and this is the smoothest shave I've ever had, thanks to this double-edged blade. <laughs> The Jack Benny program has been brought to you by the American Tobacco Company, America's leading manufacturer of cigarettes. The Jack Benny program has been selected for viewing by our armed forces overseas. Appearing on tonight's program were Frank Nelson, Mel Blank, the Sportsman Quartet, Margaret Brayton, Yogi Orgeson, Mike Ray Hill, William Munchau, and Richard Deacon. Remember one week from tonight on this same station, be sure and watch Ann Southern in Private Secretary. Jack Benny's next television show will be in two weeks. This is Don Wilson, and ladies and gentlemen, one tiny burning ember from a campfire, a lighter to discarded match or cigarette, left to smolder or thrown from a car window, can cause a frightfully destructive forest fire. So help prevent forest fires that destroy millions of acres of timber land, cripple watersheds, and blast our natural resources that are so urgently needed. Remember, only you can prevent forest fires. Thank you. Be sure and watch Jack Benny's show in two weeks. <laughs>